Um, I spent three weeks walking about 350, 360 miles of the English coast, which was amazing. But since I've been back, I've been really tired. Probably not too surprising if I think about it, but it didn't feel that tiring at the time. So I'm quite interested in sleep right now and good quality sleep. I'm also interested in when I give an embryology lecture in a dark lecture theatre, why do students fall asleep? It's clearly not because of the embryology, so it must be something to do with the, the light levels, right? Um, that thing about using your phone late at night and blue light and yellow light and mucking up your sleep, is that real or is that just some marketing thing? Um, let's have a look at the neuroanatomy of light, circadian rhythms and sleep. Because, you know, neuroanatomy doesn't make me sleepy. <laughs> it's a really interesting circuit. We looked at the, um, the cells of the retina a little while ago. And in the retina, you've got light detecting cells. They have opsins, they have proteins that react to light, different wavelengths of light. Here's the retina in here. And we talked about rods and cones and how they're distributed around the retina. Uh, cones, uh, they can detect different wavelengths of light, so they detect color, or they react to different wavelengths of light. Uh, rods are incredibly sensitive. Rods do general vision, they react to light. So rods and cones make up a picture, make up visual information. And we saw there was a layer of retinal ganglion cells. And those retinal ganglion cells are the ones that actually carry action potentials back to the brain. And there are some special retinal ganglion cells, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, which in fact themselves are intrinsically photosensitive. They react to light. They have, um, they have an opsin as well, melanopsin, another protein that can react to light. Only about maybe 1%, maybe 2% of all the retinal ganglion cells are intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Um, and one of their roles then is they can detect light. They're not involved in forming an image, in forming vision and shapes and that sort of thing. They're just about detecting light and the level of light. And their most obvious use is in the dilation of the pupil, in the, the diameter of the pupil, in adjusting how much light passes into the eye. So uh, when exposed to a very bright light, those uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells detect lots of light, trigger a reflex in the brainstem, causes the pupil to constrict and reduce the amount of light entering the eye. They seem to have a whole bunch of other functions as well, and one of those is in sleep and the circadian clock. I have talked about the pupillary light reflex or pupillary light response elsewhere. Go and do a search for that if you want to find out about that reflex. The melanopsin in these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells um, has peak sensitivity to light at about 460 nanometers. That is at the blue end of the visible light spectrum. And those IPRGCs, those intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, um, they project to all sorts of areas of the brain the brain. Um, ooh, okay. One of these areas is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN. Um, I should remove some bits before I lose some bits. Um, suprachiasmatic nucleus. Mm, okay, well, the chiasm that this name is referring to is the optic chiasm. You have two optic nerves coming in. We're talking about the eye, and the optic nerves uh, meet and cross at the optic chiasm. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus, right? Well, what's superior to the chiasm? The optic chiasm. The optic chiasm is there. Um, here in the middle, we have the rugby ball of the thalamus, and 
inferior to the thalamus and anteriorly, we have the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is below the thalamus. And in the anterior part, we find the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The hypothalamus is responsible for a wide range of basic body functions. It has effects on heart rate and blood pressure and body temperature and hunger and thirst and water and uh, you know, drinking and how much water is in the body and all sorts of really basic things, including sleep and wakefulness. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is so named because it is, because it is superior to the optic chiasm and it's in the hypothalamus. Some of those intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells project axons to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now being a nucleus, that means that it's a collection of neuron cell bodies within the central nervous system. So it's gray matter. So we can expect connections and circuits and synapses to be found in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So What's going on in here? Well, what is um, the circadian clock? Circadian rhythms and the circadian clock. Um, okay, so circadian comes from two Latin words, circa, diem, circa, about, diem, a day, about a day. So the circadian clock or the circadian rhythm is about 24 hours long. If you look at cells in the body, um, the circadian rhythm refers to changes in activity of the immune system, activity in the digestive system, activity in uh, changes in energy, changes in um, wakefulness, uh, you know, alertness, arousal versus sleepfulness, right? We, you know, we, we have these daily changes. We have this 24-hour cycle of, of waking up and being alert of when we're hungry, when we're active, when we're tired. That's the circadian rhythm. Now, if you look at cells in the body, a wide range of cells in the body, they seem to have a built-in circadian clock to a certain degree. I did this weird experiment once when I was um, a connected tissue biologist. We were looking at gene, express, gene expression and protein production in cells in the lab, and we were worried that maybe our measurements were being affected by the time of day. So I, I had some cells in culture and I looked at the levels of gene expression every two hours through 24 hours. Yeah, those were some long days. Every two. Um, and of course, you've got to repeat the experiment a number of times. And we found that, yes, there were natural changes through 24 hours for these cells in culture. Now, if you leave those cells long enough in culture, they kind of lose that clock. But the cells in the body seem to have a circadian rhythm, a circadian clock. And they are all synchronized by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So the cells in the suprachiasmatic nucleus have their own inbuilt clock. But somehow that clock is um, checked every day by the changes in light level. So it's reset. We've experienced this, right? If you travel to another country in another time zone, your circadian clock does not match the circadian clocks of everybody else in that time zone, but over time you adapt to that time zone, right? And it's the levels of light that are helping your clock adapt to that time zone. If you, there's, there were some experiments a long time ago. If you put people in a cave <laughs> um, for a period of time, so there's no natural light at all, uh, and let them live their lives, their daily activities, um, they cycle through a circadian rhythm that's a little bit longer than 24 hours, but they have this own inbuilt rhythm, but it goes out of sync with what their rhythm was because they're not being exposed to light. So light has an effect on, this, on the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which keeps the clock in check, which keeps the, the the circadian rhythms of all the cells through the body also in check. Um, so how does that work? That's right, it's those intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. They send axons out to a, a, probably a dozen different areas of the brain, but they send some of their axons to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So those intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that are particularly sensitive 
to the blue end of the visible light spectrum, they send information about um, the level of light to the cells in the suprachiasmatic nucleus and keep their internal clock synchronized with um, light and dark. And this changes through the year. This changes with the seasons, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, and probably the Southern Hemisphere. I don't live there. I live in cold Britain. Um, and it, our days get shorter as the, the year goes through to the winter. And then the days get longer um, as we move into the spring and the summer. And those levels of light change and they have effects on uh, larger rhythms, seasonal rhythms, annual rhythms. Um, but light and dark affect our circadian rhythm, our circadian clock. Of course, we've broken much of this with electric lighting. We don't, we're not exposed to just natural light anymore. We're exposed to our own electric lights at home. We've mucked up our rhythms. Our lights are too bright, too late. And in just that right wavelength to uh, muck up our sleep schedules. The suprachiasmatic nucleus sends outputs to the pineal gland. The pineal gland produces melatonin. And our melatonin, cy melatonin cycle, the levels of melatonin in our body, in our body, cycle through the day as part of our circadian rhythm. When melatonin levels rise, we have reduced alertness, increased sleepiness, decreased activity. So as our melatonin levels start to rise, we start to get sleepy, we go to bed, we fall asleep, and melatonin levels peak in the middle of the night sometime when you're asleep, and then drop back down again, and then you wake up. Um, levels, high levels of blue light reduce melatonin production by the pineal gland and affect that, <laughs> right? So yes, um, light, and particularly light peaking at 460 nanometers, but also light near that end of the spectrum, the intensity of light uh, affects this process, this, this process of uh, sleepiness. Now this can be useful, right? So um, if you're a shift worker and you have to work at night, well, Lots of blue light could be useful in keeping you awake. We do know that shit, there are health problems associated with shift work. If you are traveling to the other side of the world, airlines can change the level of light and change the temperature of the light, the color of the light, to help passengers shift towards the time zone that they're gonna be in when they arrive, right? Uh, melatonin is a supplement that you can take to also affect your sleep and help you um, avoid jet lag. So yes, this is a real neuroanatomy circuit. A small percentage, one or two percent of the retinal ganglion cells in the retina are intrinsically photosensitive. They detect the level of light, the intensity of light. They don't form vision. They send that information to a wide range of regions of the brain. One of those is the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus. The suprachiasmatic nucleus is responsible for synchronizing the circadian clock through the body. It's responsible for maintaining your circadian rhythm, part of which is wakefulness and sleeping and wakefulness, the sleep cycle. And it does that by sending projections to the pineal gland, which changes the amount of melatonin being produced during the day. High levels of melatonin lead to you falling asleep. So yes, late at night when you should be, your body should be preparing for sleep, um, bright screens, bright light, particularly in the blue end of the spectrum, will uh, interrupt your sleep cycle to a certain extent. So having those, what do they call it, the night filters where the screen's a little bit warmer and what have you can help. The best thing though is to, and we're talking about an hour and a half, two hours before you want to go to sleep. The best thing to do is to just reduce the amount of light that's getting into your eyes as the day goes on. You want to mimic the real world if you want a healthy sleep cycle. Recent research is also suggesting that those intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells also project to the prefrontal cortex and other regions of the brain and may have an effect on mood and behavior. Something for the future. Clinically then, consider damage to the brain. We talked about the suprachiasmatic nucleus, but of course what I've what I'm holding here is half the brain, which means there is a suprachiasmatic nucleus on the left side and the right side. Um, so damage to both of those suprachiasmatic nuclei 
will probably lead to sleep disorders. And this is something that we see in Alzheimer's and other degenerative diseases where if those parts of the brain are damaged, it has an effect on sleep cycles causing insomnia and what have you. Um, uh, and the final answer, so is that the reason why students fall asleep in dark lecture theatres? Yes, absolutely, because my embryology lectures are fascinating. Um, but yeah, there we go, a little bit of neuroanatomy, and I have been using that to try and help myself get a, a better night's sleep. I'm quite good at letting my, uh, my environment get darker as the day goes on. But hopefully that was interesting. Hopefully if you've come across this topic that's explained it a little bit more clearly and explained why those long names are named as they are. Um, okay, right, see you uh, next week. Bye.